Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein, the Director of Physician Engagement of the MAVEN Project, and I'm pleased to be introducing Patient-Centered Communication Skills Workshops, the Four Habits Model, a four-part workshop series on Tuesdays in February on communications to help you achieve patient adherence and better health outcomes, time-saving techniques for efficient clinical visits, and clinician satisfaction. This has been a collaborative effort amongst four exemplary MAVEN Project physician volunteers who share a passion for teaching communications and provider wellness. This first session is an introduction to the four habits model and habit one, invest in the beginning, techniques and best practice sharing with Dr. Scott Abramson and Dr. Susan Leggett Johnson. Dr. Scott Abramson spent his career as a neurologist at Northern California Kaiser Permanente for over 25 years, he has been passionately involved in the communication and physician wellness projects at Kaiser Permanente, where he has been on the regional board of physicians for these endeavors. Dr. Susan Leggett Johnson is an established and highly skilled practitioner with more than 30 years of experience providing exceptional care to adult patients as an internal medicine physician across Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia. In addition to patient care, she has served for more than a dozen years as a healthcare executive in a large medical organization. I ask um, if possible, um, you can feel free to keep your cameras on, but understand if you can't, um, there will be some opportunities for interaction, um, but do ask for you to keep yourselves on mute. That would be great. Feel free to type um, any comments or questions in the Zoom chat bar and there should be time for interactive discussion at the end. Um, we will also be um, doing some very brief breakout rooms where we put you into smaller groups. And I know that some of you might be in clinic and may not be able to actually speak, but just to listen in, but wanted to let you know that that will be happening. We'll give you an alert to that. Um, CME credit is available for this session and you will receive an online survey after. The UCLA Geffen School of Medicine is our accreditor and they will send you a summary certificate of all of your CMEs at the end of the calendar year. Our four speakers have no disclosures. Um, and as I had mentioned, the recording should be available by the end of the month. And we really encourage you to attend the subsequent three sessions of this Four Habits Communication Series, which occur every Tuesday in February. And please ask um, or tell your clinic leaders that this workshop series is available for your clinic and providers. We can set up a customized session just for your clinic. So I'm done with my long introduction and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Scott Abramson and Dr. Susan Leggett Johnson. Um, let's see, I'm trying to advance the slide here. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Jill, for those inter introductions. And um, one thing I, uh, I, I have been, um, let me just talk to you here. Um, and so for me, this, this little statement says a lot. I was a neurologist for 40 years at Kaiser Permanente. And for the first 20 years, I thought, you know, I did the usual thing, you know, find it, fix it, give a diagnosis, give treatment. And if you would have asked me, I'd have said, you know, I'm a, I'm a great communicator. You know, people, I tell people what they have. I give them treatment. I, I thought I'd communicate great. And then I took this communication course and I realized how much deeper and how much more meaningful these communications can be. And the benefit is to the patient. And, and it was to me, it increased my joy and, and meaning in medicine. And I can tell you, I would have probably retired a lot earlier than 40 years had I not taken this course. So let me ask you a question. Why is communication? Why communicate better with our patients? Why? I mean, let's say you have two clinicians, uh, both equally skilled. They do the similar questionnaire. They do similar examinations. They give the same diagnosis. They give the same treatment. What difference does it make if one of them has a little bit better bedside manner? What difference does it make? So what I'd like you to do is think about this. Don't, don't chat anything for about 15 seconds and just think about that question. And 
then we'd like to hear your thoughts about this. So I'll silently count here. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, five Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. Okay, um, let us hear your ideas. What difference? Why communicate better? Why communicate? Why sit in on this course? Feel okay. free to chat in the box. I don't see any chats as of yet. So Barbara said, Barbara said, if you don't communicate well, the patient won't understand their treatment. Mm -hmm. Someone said, makes the patient feel heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Anything else, Susan? Poor communication leads to poor outcome mm -hmm. and better compliance. Uh -huh. Improves your relationship. Those are all the chats. Boy, okay. And you know, those are those are kind of those are the answers that we've received in the past too. And people mention those patient outcome. If people if people understand, they will they they will comply. And this is the mantra that we use is better communication builds better connection, connection builds trust, trust builds compliance, and compliance means better patient outcome. Now, there's some further values, and I think some of you alluded to that, about the, about the clinician being more satisfied. I know it certainly happened with me. And so these are some of the other things, is not just patient outcome, but clinician outcome. And of course, as clinicians, we're going to feel better if patients follow our advice and they do better because we're going to give them good advice. That's one thing. But the other thing about clinician outcome is, is feeling that connection with a person, with another person as a human being. When we can establish that, it really adds to our, to our joy and, and meaning in medicine. And like I said, that's why I am so passionate about this. That's why I'm so grateful to be able to talk to you about this today. And finally, uh, I know that there may be some pushback on this. People say, well, if you're going to do all these strategies for communication, we're going to, it's going to take a lot more time. But, but our position is this, that when you do this, and I've certainly experienced this, you save a whole lot of time. Um, I don't know whether you guys in your clinic, whether you have patient satisfaction scores, uh, patients rate how their visit went, but I can tell you in a lot of places they do. And and better communication does correlate with better uh, clinician satisfaction scores and also less risk of malpractice. So there's a, this is a, there's a lot of science behind this. This tells that uh, the patient, the patient uh, survey scores are better and also that there's less burnout when people have taken these courses. Um, this slide shows that when you do this communication course, there's less malpractice. And we can go back to these slides if you want more details, but I'm just going to Mention, that, mention them because the science behind them. So I'm gonna turn this over to Susan and she's gonna tell you more about the objectives of this course. Okay, so today's objectives are to introduce the four habits model of communication via a four part series. Today is part one. To share benefits, barriers of a consistent and structured communication approach. We know you have your way of doing things. We're looking for opportunities where you can shift to perhaps make it a little bit um, better for you or and the patient. Develop a better understanding of this model, the four habits model, and encourage you not only to learn about it, but to apply elements of this model to your current approach in your clinical setting. So the four habits model was created over 20 years ago at Kaiser Permanente by Dr. Terry Stein. It's made up of four parts. Invest in the beginning, which is habit one. And habit one, the, the skills help clinicians create rapport quickly during the first crucial moments of building trust. It helps to convey knowledge of the patient's history explore the patient's uh, concerns, and plan the agenda. In habit two, eliciting the patient's perspective 
it helps to address skills that helps us as clinicians to find out what matters to the patient, how they see things and what impact their concerns is having on their life. We don't always ask that question. And then have it three, express empathy. It helps clinicians acknowledge patients' feelings and experiences by demonstrating empathy, either in a touch or words that we use. This habit is extremely important toward building trust and adds depth and meaning to the visit. It is also a habit that we frequently as physicians and clinicians and nurse practitioners overlook. And then the last habit, investing in the beginning. This habit helps clinicians frame diagnoses in terms of the patient's original concerns, ensure patient involvement when completing the visit, and for making follow-up plans. So because of its effectiveness, noted in a 10-year KP experiment, which demonstrated a significant rise in patient satisfaction, the model continues to be taught to more than a 25,000 permanent clinicians. As a retired KP clinician, I will tell you, we introduced new physicians to this model very early on within the first three months of their tenure with us. And we continued through various processes to expose our tenured physicians. It was something we never got away from. It is still used today across the program and continues to show improvement in patient outcomes, clinician satisfaction, and clinical efficiency. Mm -hmm. Now, let us drive deeper into habit one. Scott? Yeah, thank you, Susan. And just one more thing about, about the Kaiser for Habits model is the main, the main emphasis is on habit is really, you, we, just by uh, presenting this workshop today, it may not make a difference. You've got to actually practice this stuff. You've got to do it day after day, patient after patient. That's the way a habit works. So in habit one, best in the beginning, we're going to divide this into sort of three sections. First is the basics about how to establish rapport. Second part is planning the visit. And the third part is investing in the end. Now, I want you to just think a minute about how you invest in the beginning. What do you do in establishing rapport with patients, whether they're, they're new or, or old ones? Think for about 10 seconds, and then if you could chat your, your answers to us, we'd love to hear them. Okay, and you can start. Start chatting. What 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 sort of things do you do to make people feel comfortable to establish rapport? Someone said, Darlene said, introduce myself and ask names and relationship to the patient if others are in the room. Great. Uh, so Luan, warm greetings and smile. Jermaine, mm -hmm. introduction was to who you are and extend a hand. Mm -hmm. Barbara. Greet them in a welcoming way. Mm -hmm. Last chat, body language, sit down, and don't wear a white coat. Yeah, don't wear a white coat. Okay. Yes. So those are some real good basic things. And these are kind of the things that, that people have come up with in the past. Um, and uh, I think it was Luan mentioned smiling. You know, we, sometimes we just underestimate the power of a smile. I know when I took this course, I learned that. And, and actually what I did is I started smiling to, uh, you know, as soon as people would come in, I would start smiling. And uh, I, there was one little old lady that I saw for years and I put on my smile, you know, it's kind of phony, but I put it on my smile. And she says, Dr. Abramson, you have a lovely smile. She said, I didn't even know you had teeth. So that can work, you know, shaking hands, sitting down, introducing yourself in your role. You mentioned that thing, ask people how they'd like to be, be present. Apologize for being late. You know, when I see people um, that go to Kaiser and they know I'm working at Kaiser, they always give me their Kaiser misery story, you know? And, and one of the things they say is, look, I went to see my Kaiser doctor, I had to wait 45 minutes. 
They say, I don't, you know, I realize you doctors are busy, emergencies happen, I understand that, but at least the doctor should have the decency to apologize. My time is valuable too. Um, Explain the use of the computer. We'll, we often will tell our patients how do you, you know, we're going to turn to the computer now, we're going to use a computer, but how often do we manage it up? How often do you say, look, I'm going to take this computer because this really helps me review your history. This really helps me look at your x-ray. Let's manage up those, those people, uh, those things that we have um, and making a social statement. And the, here's the thing about making a social statement. It's not just about, hey, how's the weather? Did you find parking? You know, what the, how about the 49ers? What about the Super Bowl? It's not just about that. A lot of it is about, can, can be on the other side. It can be making a social statement about yourself. And patients, they don't, they don't sit and chat with each other and say, boy, you ought, to, you ought to hear the way my, you ought to see the way my doctor can feel a spleen. Uh, and boy, what my doc can do with a stethoscope. You, you know, they, what the conversations that they have are, you know, my doctor just had a baby. My doctor has the cutest little schnauzer, you know. Guess where my doctor went on vacation? That's what they really, that's what they really care about. Um, so let's... Uh, talk about some of these things and investing in the beginning in a little more detail. So let's say George, age 92, he visits an urgent care doctor with his adult son. And George had fallen earlier today and was having knee pain. The doc, smiling professionally, introduced himself, shook hands and sat down. He apologized for the fact he was running 30 minutes late. He reviewed the past history in the form that George had given. He commented on on George Atlanta Brave baseball cap. He explained that he'd be putting some information on his computer to help him remember everything. And then he said, you're looking pretty good, Grandpa. I said, the urgent care doc, here's what we're going to do. Now, what did the doctor do well in establishing rapport? And I wrote down again the, the history right below that. So do you want to chat some of the things that, that you think that the doctor did well? Someone said, sat down. Sat down, he did. Yeah. Smile. Smiled, he did. Yep. Commented on the cap. Yeah. Yeah. Nice social comment there. Yeah. They got That's a little it. conversation about baseball too. It was really nice. So someone said shook hands and apologized for being late. Yep. He did all those things. And those are all great things. But what habit one strategies could the doctor have done better? Chat those anybody answers. got any anybody got any thoughts on that? Somebody no mentioned thoughts. that earlier. Somebody no thoughts so far. I'm sorry. No thoughts. No thoughts. So, oh, here we go. We have um, not call him grandpa. Uh huh. Ask if he can be called patient grandpa. Right. And then someone said earlier that it's a good idea to wash hands, especially in this day and time. Yeah. Exactly. And you're absolutely right. I mean, and I want to, and, and to give you a little background, Grandpa George, that was my father. I was with him at the time. And frankly, when the doctor, you know, addressed him that way, I'm thinking to myself, you know, my father's 92 years old. He deserves to be called Mr. Abramson, unless he says otherwise. But the doctor didn't give him that opportunity. And secondly, did he introduce himself to everyone in the room? He did not. He did not even inquire as to who I was, what my position was. And it turned out my father at the time was having 92 years old, he's having little memory issues. And I was really the decision maker for him. And to be honest with you, I really didn't connect with that doctor. I didn't trust him. And I, was, I would have been a little bit skeptical and I was skeptical about what that doctor recommended. So here's another uh, example, uh, going deeper into investing in the beginning. Uh, let's- um, So I, I'll just make a couple of other comments also, Scott. Yes. I just wanna remind clinicians that effective healthcare communications also contribute to health equity. We have to consider health literacy, language incongruence, cultural differences, whether that cultural difference is related to age, race, gender, or sexual orientation. 
And um, all of those things can have a major impact on the clinician's ability to build that trusting relationship when they're first meeting. Examples include use of medical descriptions that patients with health literacy can understand, uh, proper use of language interpreter services. I mean, how many times have I seen it where the clinician, nurse, or CA are muddled, you know, taking the time to muddle through that visit because the patient knows some English and they're hoping they could get enough across? Not a good idea. Also, someone mentioned it in the chat earlier, body language. When you don't speak the same language, body language is so much more important. So walking in the room with a smile and eye contact, critically important when you can't speak the language. And then one of the things that's near and dear to me is addressing an older patient, especially African-American patients. And I also learn Asian-American patients by surname and not by first name out of sheer respect for that patient. When I was training in Louisiana, this was not done. It was not done on purpose. It was not done because of sheer disrespect and or unconscious bias. Uh, but I'm telling you, it makes such a difference and many people don't think about it even today. And then as Scott said, acknowledging patients and the um, members in the room, in our Latinx community, it is so important to acknowledge the family members that took time off work to come into the appointment with the patient. And if it's a transgender patient, being aware of the pronoun of choice. So just a few ideas. So let's look at an example of establishing rapport quickly. What invest in the beginning skill is demonstrated in this clinical interaction where nurse practitioner Patty Jones greets her patient, patient Esther. So nurse practitioner Patty says, good morning, Esther. Glad you could come in today. But first, tell me about Luis's first birthday party last month, right? And, and then patient Esther just beams with a smile and just thought it was so nice that nurse Patty asked. And she told her that the whole family was there and the boy is so smart right, and started showing pictures. And then nurse practitioner Patty commented how cute the boy was and about his eyes and that Esther must be such a proud grandma. Then she went on, you know, to, to begin the visit, the formal visit. So the visit went on, blood pressure meds were refilled, you know, back pain addressed and diet reinforced for her pre-diabetic condition. But later on that day, Esther was at bingo with friends. And here's a little bit of what she said about her visit. She said, I have the nicest nurse practitioner, Nurse Patty. She's so sweet. You know how I love to eat. Well, Nurse Patty talked to me about my diet. And I just ordered that low-fat cookbook she said would help. Hmm. Dr. X was my, diet for, my doctor for years. He was always getting on my case about losing weight too. I'm sure he's a good doctor, but I really like Nurse Patty. So let's ponder a few questions. First, how long did it take Nurse Practitioner Patty to interact using a social statement? You don't have to chat it. I'll just say it wasn't long at all. We're talking seconds, under one minute, under 30 seconds. Which clinician, nurse practitioner Patty or Dr. X, was more likely to get Esther to consider changing some of her dietary habits? I think it probably would be nurse Patty based on her comments to her friend. And then in the long run, how would making such a social statement improve patient outcome, improve provider satisfaction, or and save time? I do want you to think about those three questions and, and send a chat on at least one of those elements. How would making a social statement improve patient outcome, provider satisfaction, or and save time? So Lawan said, build rapport and trust. So because of building rapport and trust, it will likely increase the patient's ability to follow your directions, you know, that's important. The compliance, yes, absolutely. 
attention to the patient and your investment in the patient's care goes a long way. And, and that was also stated. I'm wondering if anybody thinks it would save time. No one chatted that. Someone did say patient feels happy after the visit and the doctors feel happy after the visit usually. And someone did say it would save time. It absolutely has been shown to save time. Maybe not in that moment, but within that visit or within the next visit, it will absolutely help the doctors and the nurse practitioners be more efficient in the long run. But even in that visit that day, because at the end, someone said in the long run, but at the end, if that patient has bonded with you and there's a feeling of trust, more than likely they will have less questions because of the skepticism that Scott mentioned he had with his father. So absolutely. This this just making that simple social statement, wow, what a cute, cute little baby, just developed so much. And it brought joy to not just the patient, but to the clinician in that situation. So here's another um, strategy for establishing rapport is making a familiar medical history statement. So in, here's scenario one. Mr. Scott visits Dr. Johnson. Mr. Scott's medical record lists chronic conditions X and Y, but his visit today is for new symptom Z. Now, Dr. Johnson, he, she's aware of the recorded past medical history because she reviewed the chart, but she just doesn't take time to mention it. So let's see how that goes. So I am Dr. Johnson. Hello, Mr. Scott. What brings you in today? Oh, hi, Dr. Johnson. Well, um, you know, I had this condition X and uh, this was a couple and uh, it came into the emergency room and and uh, maybe how long I had to wait. And it, I mean, it was just a bad night. In I know how those things go. It was a bad night in the emergency room. And, you know, uh, and then I, I had this kind of rude, rude nurse. And uh, I mean, she was probably just having a bad day or something. Anyway, I had this condition X. I came in there and uh, they sent me to the specialist. And, uh, you know, he kind of figured it out. Nice fella. I think he went to, where did he go? Stanford or something? I don't know where he went. But uh, he's a good guy. He told me to take some vitamins and did pretty good. Oh, and then I had this thing, why, you know, this condition, why um, saw a doctor about that about six months ago. And he wondered if it might be hereditary. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. We, I don't know. Nobody in my family seems to have something like that. I mean, well, I don't know. Uncle Louie, you know, he was kind of the black sheep. I, I, I don't know, but it's kind of, anyway, I'm here today because I've got this, you know, new condition Z. Okay, scenario two. This time, Mr. Scott visits Dr. Johnson. Dr. J Dr. Johnson is well aware of condition X and Y in the medical record, but now she takes a few seconds to acknowledge familiarity with that information. So let's see how that goes. Hello, Mr. Scott. I've made myself familiar with your medical history. I see that you have condition X mm -hmm. and condition Y. I see the journey that you've gone on to get those taken care of in your visit to the emergency room. And I recognize that they are both stabilized and under control at this point. Yeah. What brings you in today? Well, I'm here for condition, for condition Z. But I, boy, I really appreciate you taking a look at all my records and looking at that, but I'm here for condition Z. Okay. okay. So two scenarios. In one, the clinician expressed familiarity with the patient history and the other, they did not. Think about this. In which approach is Mr. Scott likely to feel more confident in his doctor? Which approach saves clinician time? And when Mr. Scott fills out those patient survey forms, which clinician is gonna score higher on familiar with medical history? even though both were absolutely familiar. All it took was just saying those words. I'm familiar with condition X. I'm familiar with condition Y. Look how much time it saved and look how much confidence it built with Mr. Scott. Okay, so we talked about some of the basics here. And by the way, you're gonna get a handout sheet that's gonna review the four habits and a bit talk about these things more in detail. And the main thing is for you to practice these things. We didn't go over all of them in detail. The next uh, part of uh, investing in the beginning is planning the visit. Now, let's say planning the visit has two aspects. One is the, you probably never 
experienced this before, but the patient that comes in with a big list. And the second aspect of this is the list, but it's just not on paper. And this really can be the more challenging one. So let's talk about the paper list. Does this sound familiar? So I am patient Susan and I'm visiting Dr. Scott. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Scott. I've made a list of my problems, just like they said in the AARP pamphlet. And I wanna go over this with you. So my first problem is busyness. I've had it a long time. I, I don't even know what's going on, but definitely want to talk to you about that. My second problem, sore knees. Both of them hurt. One of them is swollen. My third problem, constipation. Wow, I used to be regular as rain, and now, boy. My fourth problem, my fifth problem, my sixth problem, my 17th problem. I'm not sleeping at all. I haven't slept in days. I, I don't know what to do. So that's the paper list. What's the most crucial thing you can do when presented with a long list by the patient? And here is our answer. This is our suggestion. And believe me, I, this has worked for me physically take the list, get control of the list, and then give it a KO, a knockout. But the most important thing is to get that list in your hands, whether it's in a telephone or a paper or whatever. And this is what we mean. Do you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term TKO. It's a boxing term. It means TKO. It means technical knockout. So here's how we knock out the list. Here's what we mean. Is first most important thing, you take the list. Susan, uh, thank you for making that list. Wow, this is fantastic. Um, let me take a look at that, please. And so not only did I take the list, but I gave her a compliment for making the list, but I got a hold of that list. Now, I don't have to listen to those 17 things that go on in detail and who knows how long they would go on for, but I have the list in my hand. Next, I peruse the list. I give the knowing nods. So as I hold the list here in my hand, I'm going, oh, mm -hmm. a knowing nod. Mm -hmm. Oh, number five, mm -hmm. number six, oh. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I'm giving expression that I've heard the problems, I've heard the list. And finally, after you take the list, you give the knowing nod, finally you just optimize the list. Well, um, you know, I, Susan, I am most concerned about number three and number 14. Um, I thought we would talk about those. Is there any particular one that you'd like to add to that? Or are three and 14 good for you today? Okay, so that is, that is what we mean by giving the list a TKO, knocking it out. You take the list physically, give the knowing nod, uh-huh, yeah. And by that, by that, you've acknowledged to the patient that you understand the complaint. You understand, you don't have to go into great detail about the constipation and about, you know, the insomnia, which have been long-term things. Um, Okay, so can anybody hear me? Everybody hear me okay? Okay, so what we'd like to do is just, this is just a simple exercise that we can do in a breakout room in groups of three. And we'd like each of you to have the opportunity to try this. Maybe it'll work for you, but we just want you to try it. So I put divide, divide into threes. And so one person uh, is the clinician and one person is the patient with this make-believe list. And just practice those simple techniques. Patient comes in, the patient, so the patient comes in and starts going, here's my list, number one. Number two, who's ever playing the condition? Take that list, give a compliment for, for taking the time to make the list, give the knowing nod, this is TKO, take it, knowing nods, 
and then optimize the list. Gee, uh, I'm interested in number three and four seem most pertinent to me. Um, what do you think is the most pertinent? Or maybe just stick with three and four. Does that all make sense? Uh, any questions about what we're supposed to do? It's just a simple thing. I just want you to, it takes maybe 30 seconds to do that exercise, but I'd like all three of you in each breakup room to just practice that. Great. So um, this is Dr. Einstein and um, I've divided you up actually into four breakout rooms with each of our four habit speakers being the lead. Um, Barb, just so you know, one of the providers, um, Dia is in the middle of clinic and will not be able, she'll listen in, but not able to participate. Um, and I'll um, give you each five minutes in the room. If you've already run through everybody practicing, you can feel free to just start a short discussion on just people's experiences with some of these habits. And then what I'll do is I'll call everybody back in in five minutes. So I'm just about to click a button to open the rooms and you'll automatically be distributed into a smaller breakout room. Here we go. All right, great. So, so, um, so we, we, we did the paper list and this is the not on paper list. Um, so let's see. Are how we, we going to get some feedback from the participants? You know what? Uh, let's do that at the end, Barbara. Let's do that. Okay. At the end, okay. Um, so patient Susan. So we talked about the paper list. This is the not on paper list, a little more difficult. So patient Susan, this is Dr. Scott. She has no paper list, but she has concerns. Okay. Thanks you for seeing me, Dr. Scott. I've been suffering with busyness. I don't know why. I mean, I don't know what it's from. Yeah. Oh, okay. Dizziness, dizziness. Um, well, I'm Dr. Scott and um, I'm gonna do my dizziness questions. I'm gonna do my dizziness examination. I'm gonna give my dizziness diagnosis, my dizziness treatment. And Susan, and Dr. So Scott, my, my, knees, the dizziness. Uh, um, my knees have been hurting me, both of them. I can hardly walk up and down the, the stairs. I, okay, I think okay. I'm swollen. Okay, the knees, okay. Well, um, uh, Dr. Scott, he's gonna do his sore knee examination and he's gonna do his sore knee questions. He's gonna give a sore knee diagnosis, sore knees treatment. And, and, and Susan, I'm constipated. Oh, it was really, it was really I, good no, to see you. No, I'm constipated. I, constipated. All the time, nothing's working. It's like, it used to be regular as rain. I don't know. Okay, so Dr. Scott, he does his constipation questions, his constipation examination, his constipation diagnosis, constipation treatment. Susan, Dr. Scott, Dr. Scott, my Susan. husband told me not to forget. I need to tell you about the chest pain that I had last night. It's the second time I've had it. It felt like somebody was sitting on my chest. I, I don't know. It's like what my father had when he had his heart attack, but I don't know. Maybe it's just indigestion. Chest pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm sure this has happened to one of us uh, once in a while, but how can we avoid situations like this? So let's imagine that Dr. Scott takes this communication workshop and let's see how he handles this common situation now. So Susan, uh, good to see you. What are you here for me uh, to see me today for? Okay, thank you for seeing me, Dr. Scott. Good to see you. I've been suffering from dizziness. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on. It just mm -hmm. won't go away. Ah, the dizziness. Okay, well, we're going to take care of that, Susan, but is there anything else besides the dizziness? Yeah, my knees hurt, trouble going up and down the stairs. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can, you know, one of them swollen. Yeah, the knees. Okay, well, we will look at the dizziness, the knees. Was there anything else that you want to um, discuss? Constipation. constipation. I used to be regular as rain, and oh, now I... I I don't know what's happening. Yeah, so we got the dizziness, the soreness, and the constipation. And Susan, before I, we examine all that and take care of it, is there anything else? Well, my uh, that's right. My husband told me to make sure I tell you about the chest pain that I had last night. And uh, it's the second time I've had it. And, uh, you know, somebody was sitting on my chest. That's how I felt. And I know my father had this. So I'm, I'm a little concerned, but I'm not yeah. that concerned. Yeah. Okay. Well, Susan, how about we look at that chest pain first off? Okay. 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 So, so here's our, here's our, our teaching point about this on planning the visit. This is someone that comes in with those concerns, but it's just not on paper, which makes it more of a challenge. Let the patient speak, listen to the whole story, scan that whole prairie of patient concerns and then choose to explore the most important gopher hole, like the chest pain. 
Okay, so finally, we're, we're still working on investing in the beginning. And the last thing we want to talk about is investing in your staff. So two scenarios. Mr. Scott registers to see Dr. X. He speaks to registration clerk Susan. Um, gee, registration clerk uh, uh, Susan, it says on your thing. Susan, um, you know, I'm supposed to see Dr. X today. I've been having these headaches. I, I'm, whew, yeah. I'm nervous. Yeah. I don't know Dr. X. I don't never see. Yeah, Mrs. Her. Scott, Dr. X will be with you shortly. Can you can you take a seat right over there, please? Okay. Scenario two, Mr. Scott visits to the registers to see Dr. X. He speaks to registration clerk Susan, same question. Um, registration, uh, Susan, um, I'm supposed to see Dr. X today. You know, I've been having, I'm kind of worried. I, I don't even know Dr. Um, X. I'm Mrs. Scott, um, thank you for coming in. The doctor will be with you shortly. Dr. X, who's been here a long time, is very experienced. He's very thorough. He's going to take great care of you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I, I feel so much better. Okay. So in which scenario will connection be made, e you know, even before the visit? And think about this question. How do you establish good rapport with your staff? How do you build the feeling of teamwork with your staff? Anybody want to chat any any suggestions? Managing up, Barbara said. Uh huh. And how do you manage up? How do you manage them up? Taking the time, even if it's a couple of seconds, um, Jermaine said, and I guess the time that someone said day, daily huddles. Yeah, yeah, daily huddles, managing up your staff, telling the patients how good they are. You know, my wife uh, a while ago went to, see a, went to see a new doctor at Kaiser. It was just a get acquainted visit, nothing special. She came back, she says, that doctor's wonderful. What a nice man. And, I'm and I say, you know, I'm in the communication business. I'm wondering, well, what did this doctor do that made him such a great doctor? It was just a routine visit. And so I tried to inquire with my wife. I said, what, what did he do? She says, oh, what a nice man. Oh, what a, what, a, what a beautiful wife. What darling children. What the doctor did, all he had was just a picture, uh, well, uh, a picture of himself and, and, um, and his children there. But the, and, and the other thing was, when my wife went to take my son to the ENT doctor when he was real young, she takes my son there and she comes back and says, this doctor is, this doctor's tops in his field. And I'm going, how's he tops in his field? She said, she looked at me like I was landed from Jupiter. She says, well, the nurse who put Jeremy in the room told me so. Managed up. Staff, it's a mutual thing. So anyway, uh, let me just give you some ideas to think about next week. Because next week when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, habit two. Uh, getting patient perspective, but this week we'd like you to work as a habit with, try to do this with just about every patient, do one habit, do one technique, every patient, uh, every day. Uh, and then try something that perhaps you haven't done before. Maybe it's you haven't smiled before, but check in on how they'd like to be addressed, acknowledge, make sure you acknowledge all the family members, make a social statement, uh, make a familiar with medical history statement, and then try. You can think about trying those techniques about planning the visit, giving, taking the list, giving the knowing nod, optimizing the list, and those that don't come in with list first get all the all the concerns out before you plan and and execute your visit. And finally, think about how you can establish rapport with your staff, build teamwork. Think about all those things. And when we come back next week, we can talk about those and how they're working. Gosh, I, um, and, so, and Scott, I, yeah. I'd like to add just one quick technique and then we want to go back to any questions. And yeah. that is one of the things that I practiced for a long time was when I put my hand on the doorknob to go in the room with the patient, I would take one good deep breath. And when I let it out, I would smile, even if I didn't feel like smiling that day, but it was my reminder to smile. 
so that yeah. when I walked in the room, I had a smile on my face. So yeah. I think we want to go back to questions and we can open it up to live questions if you want. Oh, here, here's something Jermaine said, common courtesy treat to treat others as you would want to be treated. And also said, rather than taking the list, what about standing next to the patient and reading the list together side by side? Mm -hmm. I definitely have done that. What do you think about that, Scott? I think it depends. I think it depends on how the list is. I mean, what if it's three pages long? What if it's four pages long? You don't want to... Okay. You don't want to have to read through that. You just want to, you know, you want to get that list in your hand. So it, it depends, depends yeah. on how much. There are no more questions in the chat. So I don't know if anyone would like to write a question or open up their uh, mic and ask a question or make a comment. Um, the, in our group, there was a discussion about pediatrics and I don't know if we have really the interest of time, but about how there is some difference in terms of um, you know, building the rapport. Uh, there might not be a long list and I don't know if anyone wants to comment on any quick tips that they have for a pediatric invest in the beginning. So Barbara, I'll just take one quick stab because when I managed the medical office buildings, we had pediatricians in the building as well. And um, I know it is so important for them to establish rapport with a parent. So like the other people in the room um, and they may have to do that quickly, but uh, with the parents and then with the patient as well. <coughs> And those two things may look very, very different. And you have to decide which one you start with. I've seen many pediatricians start with the patient first and then the family. Um, so if there's a pediatrician online who would like to comment, we'd love to hear from you. I'll just chime in, Susan. This is Darlene Milk. Um, I'm a pediatrician by training and, and definitely a very great kind of mentor advised me that when I walk into the room, you shake hands with everyone in the room and acknowledge them, even if they're two years old. Um, and if they're an infant, you can shake their little foot, but basically gather the name and the relationship to, to this patient in the entire room. Uh, where I practice medicine, the family typically comes pre-COVID, of course, um, more commonly. So aunts, maybe a grandma's in the room. So just kind of immediately sort of introducing yourself and learning the names of the entire um, room, I think has been really effective as far as, you know, establishing that rapport and relationship yeah. in the beginning. Yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think that's great. I want to share a story with me. I took my daughter in to be seen by the orthopedic surgeon for her, her torn ACL and she was in uh, middle school. And while it was a great orthopedic surgeon and she established great rapport with my doctor, I mean, my daughter, she totally ignored me and she was a colleague, totally. She never addressed me and I never got over that feeling. I went back, but I wasn't happy about going back, but I knew how good she was. So I absolutely agree with your advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, um, I see there was, a, there was a question here about, uh, can you expand on how time is saved using these techniques? So I don't know if we have, uh, if any, you guys want to comment on well, that. You know, I, I think this time is saved in so many ways. Like, for instance, you heard of, uh, the scenarios we did with, with just mentioning past medical history. If the doctor mentions A, uh, X, and, uh, X and Y, instead, otherwise that the patient may go on and on about those things. But even more important, I think, is the rapport that you can generate when you, when you make those social statements when you make those familiar statements, when you introduce yourself to everybody in the room, people trust you, they connect with you, they're gonna follow your advice. And those visits are gonna go in the future and even that initial one, they're gonna go a lot smoother. You're not gonna get those patients coming back in with more questions, with calls, with phone calls, with everything else. It just, just by the nature of the connection and the trust 
things. And, and, and I will add to that. And we've seen it over and over and over because we've done the work in this space in our pr prospective permanente groups. But even when there's a language incongruence, I've seen making a social statement, bonding with the patient work so effectively. And you could almost see the uh, ease that comes over the patient and the family member. They came in guarded with lots of questions and ready to be on the defensive in the attack. And just by bonding with them, even with a different language and using the uh, over the phone interpreter or the video remote interpreter, um, I've been able to successfully build rapport so that they weren't as defensive. So they didn't bombard you with all the questions and they listen more. Uh, and I listened to them more. And I think the visits went much better and it didn't take any longer. I would also add that when you have the, the when you manage the list um, the way that uh, Scott suggested, it actually prevents you from uh, having to deal with the by the way. Like when you're about to wrap up the visit and the patient say, well, by the way, what about my chest pain? So having the chest pain up front with the list allows you to pace yourself um, in the visit. So you have an agenda in your head with the patient. Wonderful. Well, we're at the top of the hour and I wanted to give a huge thank you to Dr. Scott Abramson and Dr. Susan Leggett Johnson for leading and kicking off um, this Four Habits Model of Communications series. And thank you for all who have participated today, our physician volunteers and our um, clinic partners. Wonderful to have you here. Just as a reminder, next Tuesday and the subsequent Tuesdays in February, we have three additional sessions um, following up on more habits that you can pick up. Uh, so please make sure to register, let your staff know. And again, we would be happy to do a customized session of this series for your clinic if you think it would benefit your clinic in its entirety. Um, so please reach out to me. I'm Dr. Jill Einstein at jeinstein at mavenproject.org. And if you have any questions for our presenters, feel free to email me as well and I can follow up with them. Uh, you'll be receiving a CME survey afterwards if you'd like to claim that credit. And so please go ahead and fill that out. And um, by tomorrow, I will send you um, some additional supplemental information um, and we will get the recording out probably in a couple of weeks. We contract with somebody else to kind of do the final production for that. Uh, but it's really been wonderful to have you here today. Excellent presentation. And I hope everyone has a terrific week and has a good time practicing their new skills and habits and seeing if you end up getting different reactions from your patients and if it makes it feel smoother and more comfortable and more effective.